So this is a very famous mountain maple group of mine. I must say that I did not make it. This was purchased back in 1993 from Japan, from a very famous nursery in Japan. I won't mention which nursery, but it was purchased from Japan and it was only half the height. It was a very small group. You can see that the original pot was just this size. I put it in a much bigger pot over the years. But as you can see, it's got a large number of trees. I've lost count, but some of the trees did die. If you home in, you see there's a dead tree there, which I cut out. And some of these trees have also died, so I cut out. But there are still quite a few trees left in this group. And they're all alive. As a quick count, there are four, four and two, six, six and uh, five, eleven, eleven and three, fourteen, fourteen and four, eighteen, eighteen and four, twenty-two. Twenty-two trees. Now, I've spoken about numbers on many, many occasions. And I'm not fussed as to whether it is an odd or even number. In my Bonsai Masterclass book, which I wrote in 1986, published in 87, I've always said that once you get over the number seven, the eye cannot distinguish between odd and even numbers. So numbers absolutely not important. So it looks a magnificent group, but as with all maples, they're so vigorous. Look at it. This is just... I would say maybe three weeks growth and they were growing in the greenhouse and it is absolutely congested and looking very vigorous but this is not how a maple group should look. There are lots of low branches here which need dealing with and generally it needs a lot of thinning out. Before I put it against a white background I will just show you the sort of uh, work that I will do with First of all, I will just bring a pair of scissors, stay there, just home in on the tree. So all this foliage, fortunately they are all the same type of mountain maple. So the spring color and the autumn color is perfect. They don't clash. Sometimes if you put different trees, the autumn color can look odd. You know, some could be red, some could be yellow, some could be... Uh, orange even. So the first thing we need to do is bring it back into some sort of dome shape or conical shape. You don't even need to watch how uh, carefully you need to do it. You can just prune the ends. If I can just show you, I'm just going to prune a twig here. Doesn't matter. Now this twig here, I would say is easily 30 centimeter long. This is the old wood. So from here to there, that's all new growth this year. So there's got about six nodes. So how many leaves? There must be about 20 leaves here, all in the space of three weeks. So if you didn't prune this during the year, it will get so unkempt that it will be a veritable jungle. You will not be able to see anything. So what I'm going to do is just with the scissors, prune all the ends without even looking at the detail. I'm going to make sure that each tree is going to have like a dome shape. So that's the first step in refining or maintaining this forest. So all the ends about four to six inches long, I'm just going to trim back. Let's turn it on the turntable. There is a front and the back of the tree. When I put it against a white background, I'll explain to you. Look at the shoots here. If you come along here, look at this. This is all this year's growth. 30 centimeters or more of this year's growth. I don't want it. So off it comes. All that is going to be removed. It may seem drastic to you, but that is what has to be done. I'm not looking at the detail, mind you. I'm just trimming away. As I said, I could even do it blindfolded. Okay, come closer here and you can just still see 
how much. I'm just grabbing handfuls. I guess, you know, if you went to a hairdresser, they would do it in exactly the same way. Grab your hair and cut it. Although in my case, I wish I had that much hair. As recently as 10 years ago, I was a, like a hippie. So this is what I'm going to cut. This is what we call the easy part. When I get to the difficult part, I will alert you. So you're looking at the front. Of course, these maples arranged in the group, you cannot take it apart. A lot of people say, how do you repot this? You know, if you have to repot it, you just tease around the edges. If you want to take it apart and you destroy the group, you'll be starting from scratch all over again. Okay, I've now pruned it roughly into shape. Look at the prunings on the ground. This is what I've cut so far. If I were to work fast and didn't talk so much, as I always say, I could do this whole thing maybe in half an hour. This is quite a tricky operation when we come to refining the detail. As I say, I haven't got to that yet. This is the rough cutting that I'm doing, just the rough cutting. And then, if you remember a couple of years ago, I did a video and I had a great big twin trunk and I was plucking the leaves and everyone started calling the chicken plucker tree. Because what I'm doing it's like plucking feathers. Again, if you have a healthy maple, this is what you can do. You might laugh, but this is exactly how you would pluck a chicken or a pheasant. So, doing the chicken plucker treatment. I'm just plucking off the leaves. And why do I do it? I do it for the simple reason that I need to thin it out to make it look more elegant and also I'm doing it because I want to let light into the structure. The reason why this tree is looking so strong is because all the twigs are strong. If I didn't let light into the structure, the twigs get weak and you will get a lot of dieback. So during the growing season, I do expose the maples to full sun. I don't grow my maples in shade. I may give it some shade in the very hottest months like July, August, but partial shade, but I never put it in dark shade or I give sun for part of the day. So this is how I grow my maples, largely in full sun. So after doing the rough cut, I'm now doing what we call the chicken plucker treatment, just plucking the leaves like that. It's great fun. I bet you would like to get your hands on it to do that. But you've got to be a bit careful. It's, I think it's like plucking tea leaves. No, tea leaves are more delicate. They pluck only the two leaves. But here I'm just tearing off the foliage. I'm leaving the petiole. If we come close, I will show you what I mean about the petiole. If you look at, look at this one, for instance. I pull the leaves off, so I leave the petiole. These two little shoots there, this is called the stalk or the petiole. So I left the petiole and from there you'll get the new leaves. So I will go around the entire tree and pluck away. And then when I feel it's enough, I will then go in, home in, and start creating the pads within the different layers of branches. So already it's looking a bit uh, thinner. It should do because I've taken quite a lot. Look at that amount I've taken out, just in the space of a few minutes. So the next thing to do is to put it against a white background and I'm going to show you how I'm going to refine it. So here we are. I've put it on a turntable against the white background. So this should be the front of the tree if we come closer. I'll tell you why I need it to be in the front, because this principal tree is visible. 
Whereas if I turned it round, you can't see the principal tree. So this is clearly the back. So we're going to work from this as the front. So looking at this as the front, at a quick glance it may look interesting, but there is clearly a defect in that this tree right in the front i don't want to get rid of it because it's taken so many years to grow because i've had it since 1993 it must have been made in japan in the late 80s so this tree has been made at least 40 years ago 40 years so i would put this group at about 60 years 65 years since it was first made so this is quite an old group and it would be a shame to uh, destroy some of the trees but this tree certainly is clouding it and because it's clouding it I can do a couple of things I can just thin this or get rid of it but as I said I don't want to get rid of it so I'm just going to thin this so that I can see the principal tree and each of the trees should have a nice domed effect so hopefully we can achieve that simply by proper pruning In a forest or group planting, the tree should look very light and airy and you don't want too many branches on the trunk. We have some branches but not too many because if you have too many then it clouds the line of the tree. Now some of these branches are clearly a bit too long. I give it usually a hard trim every second year. I don't do this hard pruning every year. I just like to let it grow. So you can see how I'm tackling each individual tree. So although I look at each individual tree, I'm also looking at the tree in relation to the entire group. So you have to have what is called a strategic view. You mustn't lose sight of the wood for the trees, as the saying goes. The reason why we don't like to let too many branches grow along the trunk is that if you have too many branches growing, you won't be able to see the <coughs> individual trunks. Now this is the top. I like to <coughs> give it a nice dome shape. I noticed that in one of the comments on another YouTube video, someone said that, oh, why don't you have these round tops? Now a rounded top, signifies a mature crown. You don't want the thing going straight up poking like a feather, you know. A lot of these newly made trees have that effect. That is not a good effect. See, these sort of twigs here growing from the trunk, if it is not needed, I get rid of it. I want the trunk to be clear. See, like this one too. If you look at this one, I need to thin it. Okay, I have a little bit, but it shouldn't become so dominant as to be a distraction. Sometimes you get a few dead twigs. That's not a problem. We can clearly uh, just cut it and get rid of it so this tree is like that now these ones here i don't want those ones so this is a very very mature group and because it's been together as a group for the last 40 or so years you get this maturity, the look of mature tree. Newly made groups don't have this look. And 
I'm trying to create pads which are flat. There we go. Give a rounded shape to each tree. And if there are too many trees, I will also thin some of them. So again, I don't want too many branches. I just want sufficient branches to make it look delicate. So this is done, that's done. Then we're going to move to the side. This has got a major tree. It's got a nice dome shaped head, but too dense. I need to thin it a bit. I've resisted selling this tree, although people have asked, asked about it, because I think anyone who buys it will neglect it, unless they bring it back for me to do each year. I think if I gave one of you this tree to trim, you would be intimidated, you wouldn't know where to start. And I don't blame you. But it can be taught. What I'm doing really is teaching you how to do it. So I'm thinning each of these trees to give a rounded shape and so I can see the level, the pads between each tier. You see these different layers and too many shoots from the trunk I'm going to remove. Don't want too many. If you have too many, then you lose the pads. Pads should be clearly visible. So you see that dome shape there? That is a bit of a distraction from the other tree. Bring the bag, the usual bag trick. So you can see this is what each tree should look like, like that. Each tree should be a complete tree in its own light, uh, right, with layers between the different uh, branches. This one is a bit too long, so I'm cutting that off. So although I've cut quite a lot, it hasn't really affected the look of the tree very much. This is the small tree, let me deal with it now. When trees grow tight like this, they always come outwards, trying to catch the light. Remember the expression, and the expression about birds being able to fly through the structure applies more to forest groups like this than to anything else. So having the light airy appearances so that little birds can fly through and you can see all the branches. So you can already see it's become much thinner and I keep showing you. We will show you how much we've taken off. I'm determined to complete this while I've got uh, Jack here holding the camera. So this is a chore, as I said, I do once every second year, which 
I would say it's quite hard pruning for a group. And of course, the feeding regime is quite uh, methodical. I make sure that the trees are well fed. By well fed, I mean they should not be weak. So you can see this side, I've thinned out quite a lot. This tree, the top has died. If you come close, you can see. This has died, but the tree is well alive. But don't be surprised if sometimes you get an entire tree dying. When I started doing the video, I did show that you do get some trees that die. In a forest, that's inevitable. I can assure you that it is inevitable because the nature of trees is such that you will always get some which are stronger than others and the stronger ones dominate the rest of the group and they take all the nourishment and the weaker ones will succumb. Whenever you make a group, you have to expect that. If you don't expect that, then you're not being fair to the tree. Now this front tree, I'm still going to thin it a little more because I want to still make it light enough so that you can see the back so the back will be visible and still be delicate enough In here, there's a lot of congestion taking place. Lots of congestion there. This tree is leaning outwards, but it is very, very dense. The branch is much too long. Sometimes I can't really explain what I'm doing. The aesthetics just comes. I get the feel for what I'm doing. So the secret of course is to have the entire group looking as a unity. It mustn't look disparate. Disparate meaning it shouldn't be just formed of individual trees and each individual tree shouldn't stand out so much that they don't blend in with the group. It's like being, I suppose, in a sports team or army or whatever. You must play together as a team. So these trees are like members of a team, a football team or baseball team. They've all got to act in unison. They mustn't be so different so that it conflicts with the others. The common expression for this sort of trimming it is giving short back and sides. In England, when you go to the barbers, people say, you want a short back and sides, that means you want a hair trimmed like this. So this is what I'm doing, giving the trees a short back and sides. 
Now, you must be asking me, how often do I do this during the year? It's bound to be growing again because these trees don't stand still. You know? During the year, it will continue to grow. And you have to keep dealing with it. Otherwise, it will get completely unkempt. So, what we do is, because we've done such a lot of hard pruning, it's not going to grow so much, but there will still be growth. And, of course, the subsequent pruning will be just like minor shoots, not major shoots. You see, this is a long branch. If you come close, look at that. Over here, this is one long branch from there to there, reaching out. So, uh, it's filling this space, so I'm not too worried. So, I'll let it fill that space. Okay, now this one, it's got a nice crown here. Just show you again it's the white thing. This back pick is so useful. Look at it. So this is what we are trying to create. Each tree should have this domed shape. So we are almost done. Look at the large chunks. So there are several phases. The first phase was pulling out those long 20 to 30 centimeter or 8 to 12 inch long shoots that have been produced in the last three weeks. And then I do the chicken plucker treatment, just pulling off the leaves to let light in. That's getting a bit too high for me. I may need to stand on a chair. So Try to remember to show the trunks as much as possible. Remember when I used to do the Chelsea flower show, I used to have to trim the trees so that the timing is just right. That means I leave it till it produces enough new shoots because the Chelsea flower show used to be in the third week in May. So if I were to do the Chelsea flower show, which would take place in May, uh, we would do it at this time of the year, which is the third week in April, and it gives it one full month to develop new leaves uh, to make it look presentable. So hopefully this has thinned it quite a bit. You can now see through the tree, you can see the individual branches. I know that's more refinement to do. And if you just turn the camera around and you can see how much I've taken off. All that, all that, and on the floor as well. So I would say I have taken off possibly 50% of the foliage. If I had the time or inclination, I can count each individual leaf. There is a finite number of leaves. I'd love to know how many leaves. There must be a couple of thousand leaves that I've taken off. So there you go with this group. And I like to show this in the autumn when it has good autumn color. And that is how I would deal with this group. As I said, I'm reluctant to remove this tree because it is still part of the group, but you can still see into it. And I think this is a lovely group. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed this one. So, 
I've finished trimming this tree. It only took me about half an hour to do the entire forest group. So you see the results. Let me show you the front. This is the front, if you look from here. This is the front with the principal tree there. I've thinned this tree quite considerably. Let me show you the back so that you can compare the front and the back. So this is what the back looks like. And this is the front again. Now, because this tree has been growing the leaves for the last three, four weeks, the leaves are fairly uh, firm, so it's quite safe to feed it now. Because the group has been together for at least 40 or more years, planted as a group, it's very hard to get any fertilizer in there. So I use what uh, I would like to think is my particular trick of I drill holes, I drill holes into the soil and it doesn't matter if I disturb the root because I'm just letting air go through. This is so stiff that even the drill is getting stuck. So all I do is go right through the pot all over, right in the middle as well. I can see that quite a few trees have died. I reckon about seven or eight of the original trees have died. And as I say, it's mainly because the stronger trees have taken over and not allowed the weaker trees to develop. So after drilling the holes, what I do now is I sprinkle the fertilizer. I use a mixture of organic fertilizer the Japanese sell a lot of fertilizer, but this is my own mix. I use organic and a special tree fertilizer. I won't mention the names because I'm not really to, here to sell the product. So it's a mixture of organic and chemical fertilizer. And the chemical fertilizer is usually a high nitrogen, not too high because this is a mature group. That's all I do. I sprinkle it over the top and every time I water, this fertilizer is going to trickle in. So it's now almost the third or fourth week in April. The next time I feed will probably be July, and that's all I need to do, two feeds in the year. So again, this is the back, this is the front. I won't thin it much more because I want to leave some leaves to strengthen the tree again. When it has its second spurt of growth, I would say towards the end of June or early July. I may give it a further trim. So this is all I need to do. It's a shame that this tree is in the way because it worries me, but I still keep it because it's like what we call the dance of the seven veils. If you show everything bare, it's not so uh, fascinating. You know, when you have a veil, like these uh, dancers with a veil, Half hidden, you don't know what is behind there. It adds to the mystery of the group. And this is why this group works with this tree in the front. So this was just a little addendum to the work I did showing how I feed the tree.